In this video, I'll be going over an approach to adult diabetic ketoacidosis. And this is a pretty common problem that every student in internal medicine should know, and it's often tested on OSCE exams. So first of all, the definition. TK is a life-threatening emergency, and it's defined as a syndrome of, first of all, hyperglycemia, and then ketosis, uh, mainly due to the ketone beta-hydroxybutyrate, and number three, we have a WAGMA. So that stands for a wide anion gap metabolic acidosis. And a good way to remember this constellation of symptoms is to just remember what DKA stands for. So D for diabetes. So they have hyperglycemia. K is ketones, so they have ketosis. And A is for acidosis, so they have the WAGMA. Essentially, DKA happens when the patient has a severe insulin deficiency. It's more common in type 1 diabetics than it is in type 2s, and it's possibly the first presentation of diabetes. So the pathogenesis of DKA is precipitated by many things. So it can be infection, it could be a UTI or pneumonia, um, it can be pregnancy, pancreatitis, or any kind of severe stress. So examples being a stroke, an MI, or a GI bleed. And often another common presentation is a uh, precipitant is an improper administration of insulin. And essentially what happens in these processes is there's an increased demand for insulin that the body cannot meet because the patient is diabetic. So there's glucose hanging around in the blood, but it can't enter the cells and you get hyperglycemia. Your body will compensate for this by turning on the other mechanisms, i.e. there's glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis, but that just results in even more hyperglycemia. And you still need fuel for the brain. Your brain still needs something to keep it running. So the last process that's available is lipolysis. So that converts your fat or adipose tissue into ketones, which can be directly used by the brain. And that's why you have the ketosis and ketones are also acids so that um, ketosis also results in the acidosis so then there's a criteria for dka so the first they need hyperglycemia so that's more than 11. they need a venous ph of less than 7.3 and or they need a bicarb of less than 15. and DKA can be further classified into mild, moderate, or severe based on the pH, the bicarb, and the mental status. So there are quite a few numbers there, so it's good to know the normal values. So a blood pH is normally slightly basic, so 7.4, and if you plus or minus um, 0 0.05, then you'll get the normal values. Then there's a serum bicarb, which the normal is 24, uh, plus or minus 2. And next we have presentation. So the presentation includes symptoms and signs. The symptoms are due to, again, those three processes of hyperglycemia, ketosis, and acidosis. So hyperglycemia, you have an osmotic diuresis because there's so much sugar out in the blood and that pulls the water from inside the cells to the extracellular space. As a result, you have polyuria, polydipsia, weight loss, visual blurring, and you have a change in mental status. Your acidosis is due to the ketones and the lactic acid. That results in nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, fatigue, malaise, and shortness of breath. Next are the signs. So because of this osmotic diuresis, patients present in severe dehydration. They have a decreased JVP, decrease in their skin turgor, dry axilla or mucous membranes. They have vital sign changes, so decreased blood pressure, increased heart rate, and they have a fruity ketosis breath, and they can have Kussmaul respiration as well. And Kussmaul respiration is a unique kind of um, breathing pattern, which is increased in respiratory rate, but also very deep uh, breathing. And the reason for that is uh, breathing in this pattern is a respiratory alkalosis, which compensates for the metabolic acidosis due to all the uh, ketones and the lactic acid around. 
Now, in every patient that you're considering to have DKA, you need to think about one other condition, and that is HHS, which stands for hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. But a better name for it is also HONK, so hyperosmolar non-ketotic state. And in this, the patient has a small amount of insulin production, which inhibits the ketogenesis. So they have severe dehydration and hyperosmolality that often results in neurologic deficits and decreased level of consciousness, seizures, and coma. So a presentation quite similar to DKA, but the main thing is that their insulin, even that small amount, will inhibit significant ketogenesis. Um, Honk is more common in an elderly type 2 diabetic. It's also more gradually onset. So the criteria for honk, you need a serum osmolality of more than 320. Your blood glucose is more than 33.3, although in honk, it can often be a lot higher than that. So even for levels of 40 to 50, and they have no significant ketoacidosis. And because of that, their pH is not as acidic. So it's above 7.3, and their bicarb is usually above 15. Next we have investigations. So investigations for the etiology are precipitant. First of all, an infection of some sort could have caused the DKA. So you need to do a CBC and differential, chest x-ray, blood cultures, urinalysis, and urine and sputum CNS. Basically, if there's something you can test to find infection, you should do that. And then we have cardiac ischemia, so MI being a common cause of DKA, you need to check for an ECG and any cardiac enzymes. And pancreatitis is also a common cause, so you can test for serum amylase or lipase. Then there's investigations for management. So basically you need to do frequent and continuous monitoring of electrolytes, especially potassium, because um, hyperkalemia uh, and also other electrolyte abnormalities can result in arrhythmias and other fatal consequences. And we can monitor bicarbonate, monitor the glucose, serum osmolality, and also urine ketones, and the ABGs and NIN gap. This next section is on management. So when you're writing orders and treating someone with DKA, you should use your DKA protocol that's available at your hospital. But in general terms, you should do these things. First of all is your immediate management. So doing the ABCs for airway, breathing, and circulation, giving them oxygen, getting vitals and IV access with two large bore IVs, and consider intubation in the very unstable patient. You need to correct their acid-base abnormalities, and often they need admission into a monitored unit, like the ICU or a step-down unit. Fluids are the most important treatment, so the body is profoundly dehydrated in all patients with DKA, and they need a big IV bolus, so 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram per hour, and that's usually normal saline, and you have to add maintenance fluids on top of that. Also, do a Foley catheter so you can monitor their urine output. And next is insulin. So DKA patients are severely insulin deficient, and they need something to lower uh, their ketones and also lower their glucose. They need a maintenance IV insulin drip, and you should not give a bolus because that possibly exacerbates hyperkalemia and in some cases can also drop the glucose too low. The anion gap is actually the parameter that guides your treatment. You want to keep the glucose between 10 to 15, and you can switch to subcutaneous insulin when they're more stable. And you need to continue the insulin drip regardless of the glucose levels, because your main goal is to prevent the ketogenesis associated with DKA, which leads us to the glucose part. So when the glucose is less than 15, you actually need to add glucose in the form of D5W to the IV fluids. A patient in DKA will have low potassium stores regardless of their serum levels. 
The potassium is drawn out because of the hyperosmolarity of the serum and because the body needs to maintain electrical neutrality when it's excreting the keto acids. Once your potassium is less than 5.5 and the patient is making urine, you have to change the fluid to normal saline with 20 kcl. You can increase that to 40 when the potassium is less than 5.0. And you may also need oral supplementation with potassium to keep levels in a normal range. Carbonate is another tool that we have to treat DKA, but it's often not used unless you have severe acidosis, so a pH of less than 6.9. And the reason for this is insulin and fluids will already correct the acidosis significantly and often bicarbonate is not necessary. Cerebral edema is a dangerous complication of treating DKA and it often occurs in children but is still possible in adult patients. It can be largely prevented by following your DKA protocol and ensuring that the rate of correction of the serum osmolarity is at maximum of about 3 per hour. So how it works is when the brain cells are surrounded by a hyperosmolar serum, the brain cells form idiogenic osmos in order to prevent the water in the cell from diffusing out into the blood and losing intracellular volume. And when we treat DKA by aggressively introducing fluids which dilute the serum, the water actually wants to move into the brain cells and cause swelling that results in an increase in ICP and can lead to death. And the management of cerebral edema, if it has already happened, includes mannitol, hypertonic fluids, and also hyperventilation. And the last part of treatment is when the patient's stable, you need to educate them about how to prevent DKA from happening again. You need to make sure that they know how to manage their diabetes during stress, make sure they know how to administer their insulin and also counsel them about their diet. And that's it for the approach to DKA. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me at approach to internal medicine at gmail.com. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel to keep up to date with more videos I'll be releasing in the future. Thanks for watching.